You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for institutional advisors. Welcome to the show, Bob. Well, it must be Friday if we're talking. And it must be the fall if the markets are rocking. <laughs> They're socking the market. Yes, there this are. Week. Actually, uh, Jim, the volatility has been extraordinary. I and mean, you look at the uh, rise in the S&P for the last few months and uh, small bars, you know, a daily bar chart, but making it, getting there. I think the high was September 19th, and then it was like the world changed. All of a sudden, you have these big bars down and big bars up. So you're getting, I think, this week uh, a one and a half percent up day, a two percent, almost two percent down day, and then another up day in, in that order, and then now failing. Um, the uh, Russell 2000 has been. A good benchmark to follow, and it made its high went back in July, and lots of enthusiasm. And uh, you know, if you get big money going into small stocks, you can push them to the moon. And then, of course, the problem is there's no way out, and so it's been leading on the down. Then the other one, and it's now taken out a key low, so it looks pretty bad. Then the other one that was leading in the equities was the European stocks, and much the same. And it's now taken out uh, some important lows, but it either of these have not taken out a key low back in April. So um, we're watching that. But the main thing is the is the complete change in the nature of the stock market from. And of course, it showed you know on the way up you had with with minor corrections, no, you know, just nothing. I mean, how many more than a year without a ten percenter? So everybody was confident, and the one big update this uh, was release of the Fed minutes from September. I mean, it's old stuff. It was known that the Fed. And the term these days is dovish, meaning they're not going to tighten up. And uh, so, wham, that was one of those 200-point uh, up days. And then the next day, it gave uh, it up. So, you know, I'm, I'm impressed and, and uh, amazed with this. Uh, uh, and it's telling a, a message that uh, you've gone from complacency to concern. So one of the ones I wrote a couple of weeks ago was this was, exuberance on the way up and we had the usual um, sentiment and momentum numbers uh, generated uh, some months ago you also had the margin outstanding growing straight up and then it stopped in July uh, but there's a sort of a lead lag there and 2007, for example, the margin stopped growing in that, and that was July as well. And then the market has set its high in October 17th, I'm guessing, or just about there, and then rolled over. So this time you had the margin set its peak in uh, July. Stock market looks like a peak in September 19th. That's pretty good ballpark stuff. The other one that we had is on our proprietary model that gives upside exhaustions, and that's, uh, oh, there's about six uh, different things in that one, and it has to do with exuberance and, and time duration. And so on the monthly, it gave an upside exhaustion figure for August and then for September, and that signal on the S&P has not been seen since uh, a month or so before the stock market peaked in March of 2000 on that bubble. So the dynamics are impressive. So that one, with these measures coming in, you knew that the best was on. And part of that, of course, is the complacency. So the VIX, which is a measure of complacency,
complacency went away down and uh, has recovered uh, very nicely. Uh, well, yeah, nicely if you're playing volatility. So that was the other part of our theme of three weeks ago was exuberance and then volatility. And then the third panel on that was resolution. How do you, What happens to the market when you go from complacent, let's put it this way, extreme complacency to what is now turning out to be a rather exceptional volatility. And the indexes are going down. Um, we've also had similar action in lower grade bond markets where we think is the biggest, biggest, biggest bubble in history in, in, uh, in the bond markets. And it, uh, using junk, had a momentum high in July, set back, came up and tested uh, that high, and then is now heading down, taking out the 50-day and the 200-day moving averages. So that's distinctive. And with that, you've also had the spreads widen, which is the difference between uh, riskier investments and, like, treasuries. And it narrowed on enthusiasms and confidence, and on the uh, on the uh, you know the reaching for yield. And this is where eventually the policymakers will be considered evil, is because of this policy of z effectively zero short-term rate. People were pushed out the curve, or they're pushed out into risk, and. Uh, uh, it's an evil. I'll repeat that. So, anyways, that thing is now um, broken out on widening. It said it's the narrowest spread, which is the best for the play, in uh, June and July, and uh, started to widen, set back, and then a week and a half ago, it broke out to widening. And if you look at, uh, let's just just through the time that the Federal Reserve has been going a hundred years. Where there, there's a great belief that they can wisely manipulate interest rates uh, for the benefits of the markets and for the benefits of society. But when push comes to shove, you look back and on the history, uh-uh, because -uh. every uh, bull market <laughs> ends when the credit markets start to change, and this change is on now. And the whole point that history shows is that the central bankers have never been able to prevent the change in the credit markets that signals the end of uh, the credit expansion and the, cre and, the re and the recovery and the economy and the and speculative markets. So, these are very powerful forces, and they're overwhelming the Fed ambition now. And it's a, let's, I wouldn't say a delight to see, but for any researcher or historian, this is, this is fascinating, because this is the way the financial markets work. I know going away back in the bubble of 1873, um, in the U.S., it was pretty exciting. And then you started getting the changes in the credit markets, like in spreads and the curve, and veteran financial people would say, oh, this is bothersome. Then one of the key newspapers in New York editorialized that, well, you have the treasury system, and uh, the U.S. does not have a central bank constrained by gold. So you had the Treasury system, whereby the Secretary of the Treasury, who was uh, uh, highly regarded at the time, and he could issue credits uh, without limit because they were not on a gold standard. And indeed, uh, they, at that time, the Treasury did buy bonds to inject cash into the market. And you still got a magnificent crash and, and into a Great Depression. So, uh, and then in 1929 bubble, uh, John Moody of Moody's, his thesis was that we got rid of the old bad system and we now have a modern scientific Federal Reserve system, which is the central bank, and it was on gold. So, 
they then said that nothing could go wrong because of this uh, Federal Reserve System. Well, you know what happened in 1929. And then you move out to 2007, which did have all the characteristics of a great bubble, uh, you know, outstanding action in stocks, you had uh, good action in commodities, and uh, and soaring real estate prices. Now, that, all of those together, at a certain time, makes a bubble, and we had a classic bubble and then a classic crash. But the top of the market was in October and December, a little nervousness coming into the markets. And Greg Manku, Harvard economist, uh, said, assured everybody that nothing could go wrong because you had a dream team of economists at the Fed. And, of course, it all went wrong. So at the moment, through the summer, everybody's been confident that the Fed could look after things, that the Fed was going to continue, and while well, they were diminishing buying bonds, but the way they had it set up was that the uh, European Central Bank would come in and start buying bonds in October when the last of the Fed bond buying was uh, scheduled. But this um, setback of the markets now has got nothing to do with policy. It's overwhelming policy. And if you look back on financial history to the first great bubble, which was the South Sea bubble of 1720, and uh, it's at its peak in May, June. What's the old saying? Sell in May and go away. The stock drifted around during the summer, crashed in the fall. The next great financial bubble was 1772. Same thing, crash in the fall. Then 1825, same thing, crash in the fall. 1873 bubble, as mentioned. 1929, as mentioned. And then, of course, you get out to the 2007, where... The setback started in October, but you really got the good panic crash in the fall of 2008. So there's a long history of if you have exuberant markets and then you go into volatility and it's going into the fall, you could have a, a period of, of uh, heavy liquidation. So this, we're not calling for a crash, we're not calling for a panic. But it's at a time when uh, dislocations in the markets can uh, happen. So uh, I think we've kept our powder dry. And uh, this has been accompanied with uh, weakening commodity prices. With many S&P 500 companies buying back their stock, is the market likely to trend higher? Well, that's a good question. And uh, we've been mentioning that, uh, I guess the article I saw was at 95% of the S&P 500 companies were buying back their own stock and but what they're doing is they've been here's another example of what low cost money can do is they've been borrowing money at very low rates in order to buy the stock and also to pay dividends so it is uh, another example of market madness uh, afflicting corporations so normally on an ordinary business cycle when interest rates are low or their credit spreads are attractive at the top of a credit cycle, uh, corporate treasurers would issue debt uh, to raise some money at a low rate, but here they're issuing and for corporate purposes. But what they're doing now is it's margin. They're borrowing money to buy their stocks. And, it, and I think it, it is a highly risky business and also a symptom of a market top. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with market historian Bob Hoy. Hoy, what's driving this? Is there any particular sector, or is this right across the board? It's generally across the board, even uh, including... Um commodities which commodities we've had a very good year in the commodities because back in December uh, we noted the oversold in a number of commodity groups and labeled the potential rally as a rotation I don't know using it and eventually most groups commodity groups did rally out till around May and it was a vigorous rally uh, and uh, we noted the overbots and said, you know, take the money off the table. This is a gift. 
And then commodities generally have been drifting since then. And that also included gold and silver. They uh, they performed. Whoa, wow, they, they really moved and became overbought. And the advice to get there on that sector was to take money off the table. So then you have our work on the U.S. dollar was that once the boom started to slow down, the dollar would go up. And one of the reasons behind that is that in every post-bubble contraction, the senior currency has become chronically strong against most other currencies and most commodities for most of the time. That's why you call it a post-bubble contraction or a post-bubble deflation. And uh, so then uh, you had the, oh, we had a target for the U.S. dollar around 85, and it started to move. And then when it approached 85, it was somewhat overbought. But then we put in the note that if this really moves, you can, you know, it can get, it can go a lot further from an overbought condition. And that was uh, sort of parallel with the fact that we looked at, uh, you know, when did the first hit in the grains, they came down real hard into June and became oversold. And then you got a modest little rally and then it fell to new highs. So this is one of the things that you look at in a major stock bull market for stocks when they go bad in the fall, the serious liquidation has come out of oversold conditions. So the counterpart to that is then they move up in the U.S. dollar from an overbought condition to really overbought, which was earlier in the week. So we think that the uh, U.S. dollar, with some swings, will go up a lot further for quite a while yet. This may be perplexing to those who hate the Federal Reserve, as we do, but in order for the Federal Reserve to depreciate the currency, it needs speculators out there speculating in property, stocks, bonds, and commodities, and everything else. And once you get enough asset prices falling or not going up, then the Fed can't do its portion to depreciate the currency. Then the other issue is that during a great financial mania, most of the debt written, bonds, various obligations, or written, writ, have been written in the financial capital, which is still uh, New York. So then once the party's over, then the issue becomes, we, hey, we've got to service this debt, and it's due and payable in New York with U.S. dollars. So effectively, the bubble is a, is a huge short of the senior currency, which is dollars. So the dollar can go up for some time yet. And that then puts a problem into the gold market, for, especially for those who use gold. Uh, well, let's back up a bit here. So who, who recognize that the Federal Reserve is evil, but then they want to get even with that evil by buying gold in U.S. dollars. But then you get into the world where we are now, where the U.S. dollar has been going up. So then the dollar quote for gold goes down. And uh, that's the way it is. So anyways, what we do is take, and throughout history, taken the real price of gold, deflate it by a consumer price index or a, a producer price index. But then those oh, numbers only come out sometimes monthly and whatnot. So what we decide to do is just go right straight to the bone of the thing and take gold and divide it by a commodity index, our own commodity index. The trick was, we went to our own because we couldn't find a commodity index that didn't have gold in it, other than the economist all items. But then we couldn't get their data daily. So we've got one that's fairly close to the economist all items. Now, it said it's low. for and, and, oh, here, throughout all of the great booms in history, the real price of gold sets a low as, as the bubble eh, blows out. So, again, here, you had a low for our gold divided by commodity index in June. Then by July, it was in an uptrend. Then it got so far, corrected back, and then it needed to break above 3.9. And it did that a couple of weeks ago. So that then was another indicator 
that the financial markets were overdone and were about to get a setback. But where it helps out, Jim, is is that eventually the rising real price, so your rising gold against uh, energy prices, it adds to the profitability. If the base metal mining business is weak because of weak base metal prices, hey, guess what's happening? Then you they they reduce production capacity and you have uh, miners and equipment available. So and uh, and I was talking to a miner the other day and he says the cost of the huge tires for the big earth moving trucks is uh, are well the, the tires are available at reasonable prices. So whereas uh, a few years ago you couldn't get them at all. So anyways, uh, we're. This turn up in gold's real price is very positive for the gold mining community, and the problem is the gold stocks are facing um, some problems in the big stock market. So our view has been that one should begin to look at buying some gold stocks on a weak opportunity towards the end of October, maybe into November, and and we'll stay with that one. Bob, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Always good to be with you, and you have a good weekend. You too. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. Their website, institutionaladvisors.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter or Talk Digital Net. We're also on YouTube. You can forward comments about the show to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.